I'm Nancy Bain, and it is my great honor to welcome you to the first lecture in Microsoft Research's Race and Technology Lecture Series. The 14 lectures in this series feature some of the field's leading voices, people who've spent years looking closely at the intersections of race and technology across a wide range of topics. We hope the series will offer those of you new to this area insights that resonate with your own work or experience while offering those of you already familiar with the field openings into areas you haven't yet explored. Today, we're fortunate to hear from Dr. Sarita Amrute, whose work explores data, race, caste, and capitalism in global South Asia, Europe, and the United States. She speaks to this in her award-winning book, Encoding Race, Encoding Class, Indian IT Workers in Berlin. Dr. Amrute is an Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Washington and a director, the Director of Research at Data and Society Research Institute. Starting this fall, she will be a fellow at the Russell Sage Foundation, where she'll work on her new project, Infrastructures of Descent, South African Diasporic Politics of Sensation. Before we begin, I want to thank the organizing committee and the people inside and outside of Microsoft who have made this series possible, not least our speakers and all of you. If you're here now, we encourage you to ask questions in the chat and to stay around for a live Q&A after the talk. We've also collected some resources for further learning on the website, and we encourage you to check those out later. And now, Dr. Sarita Amrite. Hi, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here with you today. I'm going to be talking to you today about the relationship between race, labor, and technology. In my talk entitled Racist Tropes and Labor Discipline, How Tech Inherits and Reproduces Global Imaginaries of Race and Work. I'd like to start today by inviting you and asking of myself how I would situate us. I stand on the traditional land of the Canarsie people on the continent of Turtle Island. As we gather here today, I notice and ask you to notice the ongoing erasure of indigenous and enslaved peoples in building the ethic, the history and the future of these lands. With this acknowledgement and in the spirit of this talk, I invite you to ask with me and with Cree artist Kent Monkman, what would it mean to tell tech stories and immigrant stories from the perspective of the welcome and the unwelcome of this land? Our topic today is the relationship between race and labor in the tech industry. I'm going to stitch together several stories to make clear how historical precedents that created a racial division of labor continue to undergird labor in the global tech industry today. These histories are important because they show how an industry that often appears from the outside to be a meritocracy or to be ruled by the inexorable logic of the machine is shaped and reshaped by racial logics that divide populations across the world according to the putative hierarchies of ability and proclivity grounded in the racist logics of the 19th century. While an analysis of how race undergirds the development of technology can help us understand how, as Ruha Benjamin writes, tech can be racist, along, the kinds, along with the kinds of divisions of labor that both use difference as a tool to create new products and as a mean of creating hierarchies at work, race, when interpreted too narrowly, can mask other kinds of division of labor. And the latter part of my talk, I will turn to caste oppression as another vector of exploitation that is cognate and kindred with racism, as Isabel Wilkerson and Suraj Yengde have argued. Addressing caste oppression in and adjacent to the tech sector is made difficult when race is taken as a narrow ascription of skin color that divides the whole world into black and white, which is, perhaps ironically, a reinscription of the essentialism of race itself. If instead, caste oppression is seen as articulated together with race, as it functions as a division of labor within the tech industry, it becomes clear that caste should be treated as a separate but linked category of discrimination and be nominated to be a protected category within labor law and within tech companies, human rights policies. I will stitch this narrative together through four stories from my fieldwork in multiple sites in the Asian and especially South Asian tech diaspora. As an ethnographer, I use these stories to show how categories of race and technology are made, 
questioned and rearranged in everyday life. Each story demonstrates a different aspect of the narrative of the racialization of South Asian workers and how racialization intersects with the making of caste as a resource of extracting labor from oppressed bodies. The first story comes from Berlin in the mid 2000s when I was doing fieldwork for my book, Encloding Race, Encloding Caste, Indian IT Workers in Berlin. Minakshi was a bug tester, finding and often fixing places where code was malfunctioning, preventing a software package from being rolled out on time and making customers angry. She had been hired as a temporary programmer on the German green card by Dash Technologies, a business processing software company with offices across Europe. Late afternoon deepened into a Berlin night. On her screen, yellow lines of code against a black background scrolled from top to bottom while she opened three, then four other windows, copying and pasting snippets of code from one into the other. Minakshi's computer dinged loudly and she stopped the scroll. Minakshi was about to squash a bug. She opened a program called Sublime Texts, which represents parts of code in different colors, making it easier to spot a problem, and pasted a snippet of code into its waiting window. Commands or directions displayed in red, strings or written text appeared in yellow, and operators which modify specific inputs stood out in violet. She scanned the Technicolor snippet, zeroing in on a missing single close quotation. Adding the close quote allowed the compiler to recognize a series of letters, numbers, and punctuation marks as a string, which would tell the compiler to treat the piece of code as text rather than as command. Minakshi entered the missing quotation mark and ran the bug testing sequence again to see where else the program was breaking down. Though Minakshi loved this type of work, she knew that bug testing was not a prestigious job in software worlds. It was this type of back-end, non-client-facing work that she and other software engineers from India were most often slotted into when they worked in Germany, in the United States, and elsewhere on projects tied to short-term labor visas. Later that evening, Minakshi recalibrated her relationship to her position as a grunt back-end automaton-like worker in these software worlds. We sat around her kitchen table in her shared apartment and bedding, a working class neighborhood, a few Uban stops north of her office. She was boiling milk spice with cardamom, ginger, and anise seed as she tried to explain to me what being a programmer was all about. Programming is like cooking, she said. You give the computer a recipe and it follows it. Surprised at the analogy, I exclaimed, but you never use a recipe when you cook. That's different, she added, as she turned to me with a wry grin. The computer is a very stupid cook. The computer simply follows along with directions, but Minakshi can look at a line of code and realize the syntax is wrong. She can do more than just follow what is written. In her retort, Minakshi cut away the binds that tie her to the computer, asserting her clever superiority. Though not valued as creative in the software firm in which she works, Minakshi feels when she is bug testing as she does when she is cooking without a recipe. She is in control, knowledgeable, and practiced. She uses all her skills to do what the computer cannot, namely parse lines of text from commands, ingredient lists from directions. Minakshi is the clever cook, the computer is the unthinking automaton. In these moments, code is media that first of all supports a system of production and incorporates bug testers like Minakshi into its operations. It is also a media that Minakshi can then use, reflect, and riff on to understand and upend her status in such systems of work. Programmers from India themselves become the subjects of renderings that circulated in popular German newspapers during the time that the German Green Card, a temporary visa for high-skilled labor, was being debated in Congress. As part of my ethnographic practice, I gathered political cartoons, digital memes, and article illustrations from internet sites, local magazines, and national newspapers. Like Irish dock workers for the English working class in the 19th century Britain, or nimble-figured East Asian factory girls in the global 21st century, Indian coders were naturalized as hard-working computing machines who could work long hours, needing little physical or monetary compensation. This naturalization was affected through satirical images that can be analyzed as a media object that bring together text and image to both assert cognitive work as a new norm and Indian workers as exotic and primitive laborers within this dispensation. 
These images exemplify the varied yet patterned depictions of the migrant coding body. Such cartoons illuminate what Black Studies scholar Alexander Wehelie calls the abstract daily operations of racialization, the manifold techniques by which sociopolitical hierarchies are camouflaged by the natural features of the human body. Such techniques alibi hierarchies of work in the software industry where Indian programmers occupy back office repetitive jobs because of their supposed penchant for spirituality, aestheticism, and abstract mathematical work. And they act as a lever to reform Euro-US working populations to conform to global work pra practices. In this montage, Indian programmers are pinned down as manageable cognitive workers, that is, workers who manipulate symbols and produce information rather than tangible commodities for an economy that produces value through information. A panel from the satire magazine Titanic, similar to Mad Magazine in the United States from March 2000 reads, the computer Indians, how far ahead of us are they really? Beneath the title, the text continues, can Germany bear the computer Indians? Will they first take our jobs and then our German women? In a series of exposés designed to mimic the conventions of photojournalism, it showcases hard manual labor, old machines, and barbaric practices to voice incredulity. Indians are not ahead of Germans, but far behind. Each picture is isolated from its context, even while together they create a collection that claims to represent the truth of the world. Outlining each picture in black, the page juxtaposes scenes of backwardness with text that describes computer hardware manufacturing. The Indians break rocks, carry boulders on their heads, and work at giant turbines. In the text accompanying the pictures, the boulders are called silicon chips, and the turbines are described as CD-ROMs and supercomputers. The figure in the bottom right is captioned as the Bill Gates of Bangalore, who owns the license for the very successful operating system, CAST 2000. Such caricatures voice the racial threat that Indian programmers represent, that they will bring with them to Germany primitive customs and ways of life impossible to uphold in Europe. The titles and subtitles seem to raise questions about who might actually worry about the computer Indian stealing German women. Titanic, as a satire magazine, keeps the possibility open that it mocks not Indians, but old-fashioned anti-immigrant Germans. Those who describe themselves as pro-immigrant would read this piece as pointing out the untenable claims of anti-immigrant politics. Yet under the cover of this mockery, it also renders a version of the Indian coder as a primitive who could not surpass German in technological acumen. As political philosopher Ashil Mbembe writes, caricature through its gesture toward comedy masks the power of recursivity to solidify a negative image of a population. As visual speech acts, such sketches sediment a particular idea of the Indian programmer, laminate together these programmers and the machines they program, and enunciate the fears of contingency that cognitive economies bring with them. They also leave undecided, and therefore open to further elaboration, the ultimate significance of such cyborg bodies, which encompass both a hardworking automaton and its fleshy embodiment. The Indian programmer is contrasted to the real migrant threat, Turkish or Muslim migrants on one hand, and the stubborn, lower class and unreformed post-socialist citizen of East Germany on the other, within the language, the visual, visual language uh, that I'm unpacking here. In figuring debates on work and migration in terms of the Indian body, the cartoons invest the Indian IT worker with the most fundamental changes in the constitution of European and United States political economies, including shifting risk onto individual subjects and reimagining the European and American citizen as techno-savvy and entrepreneurial. Against the texture of such caricatures, Indian programmers sort themselves out, as cultural anthropologist Ant Anat Singh writes, from conflation with the instrumentality valued instrumentally valued calculating machine. They take the limited terms of their labor and redirect them, for instance, by using their social networks to gain better positions across global sites of tech labor, and by trying to extend their temporary contracts for as long as possible. Though I do not have time to go fully into their anti-work practices here. 
doing research for this book showed me that the idea of the internet as a bodiless, genderless, and raceless place was far from reality. Very much the point of my first book project was to show that the material fleshy legacies of race are very much part of how tech economies currently function. My second story stemmed from fieldwork I did in the Seattle area between 2016 and 2019. In this project, I was tracing the racialization of coding labor as a transnational ph phenomenon that both pushes racism to the borders of firms and perpetuates 19th century discourses that assign particular bodies to particular positions within a system of global capital. One of the most important legacies of this racial division of labor is that it separates out Asian workers from other kinds of race bodies, especially black bodies. In the stories that I'm going to tell you, the logic of the 19th century reemerges. In this body of scholarship, I trace the racial formation that puts Asian coders in transnational, transnational tech firms into a position as a buffer between white populations who control these economies and other people of color who are controlled and movable members of the light infantry of capital, as Marx wrote. These transnational racial imaginaries were consolidated during the period of indenture during the imperial 19th century. Across this time period, employment converged with the extraction of labor from native populations in the British Empire. And I'm showing you here an image of labor in Jamaica, indentured servants who came to Jamaica to do plantation work. On sugar and tea plantations, in indigo fields, and during opium harvests, casual labor, right, labor that was meant to be part-time and movable across the world, increased in the factory and the field, and a colonial hierarchy of global labor helped organize it. The coolie epitomized casual workers within colonial India and between India and the island plantation economies of the British Empire. The British Empire deployed contracted laborers from Asia as replacements for plantation slave labor elsewhere in the empire. As Lisa Lowe argues, finding these replacements was a key to the 1834 abolition of slavery within the British Empire. Fear of slave insurrection and the desire to expand production in plantation crops such as sugar led colonial officials to turn to the port cities of Hong Kong, Calcutta, and Bombay for replacement workers. Rather conveniently for the indentured system that would employ such workers on contract, these ports were full of impoverished rural migrants who themselves had been starved by the conversion of land, in the case of India, to cash crops such as indigo and opium, and through the elimination of small land holdings. Lisa Lowe describes the coolie as a figure marking a shift in imperial economies from mercantilism to liberalism, which coupled the promotion of free circulation of bodies and commodities with the rule of law. This shift in political ideology found its echo in a corresponding shift in the mode of labor expropriation. The entire pattern of labor on Jamaica sugar plantations, for instance, shifted as planters' calculus on extracting value from labor changed. Over the decades after the abolition of slavery in the British Empire in 1843, New laborers were employed more casually, as Creighton writes, or rather more commonly employed only when they were strictly needed. This pattern included craftsmen who, and this is another quote from Michael Creighton's work, tended to be laid off not only in the off season, but in the dead periods of the week too. The cheapening of free labor was accomplished by making work precarious so that labor was not formally that was not formally owned would be paid only when the work was strictly needed. This is an early form of what we now call just-in-time labor, calculated down, calculated down to the day, if not the hour. Within this new pattern of labor, race featured as a justification to employ indentured laborers from India and China on contract, that is, for limited periods of time. In combination with age and gender, Indenture served to establish different wage scales for women's, men's, and children's work, 
and residential segregation between Asian workers and both indigenous subjects and formerly enslaved peoples. These tactics were part of the disciplining of labor across the empire from Jamaica to Assam. The United States also used coolie labor, especially from China, to build the transcontinental railroad. The depiction of such labor as free reversed course in the United States in the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which argued contract workers were unfree because the contracts specified low labor wages and kept workers employed at these wages for seven or more years. These legal developments continued to render such workers aliens, vulnerable to segregation, nativist violence, and the mobility of the demands of capital. Such histories echo ambitions of late liberal empire today, where economic dominance interweaves with a carefully managed multiculturalism, another evolution on the idea first circulated in the age of indenture of the free circulation of commodities and people within the boundaries of a given rule of law. The German guest worker program, which brought workers from Turkey and elsewhere to Germany to rebuild after World War II, similarly follows the logic of a temporary racialized and replaceable workforce into the 20th century. And the various visa programs from the H-1B to the R-1 that support migration in the tech industry and beyond inherits the logic of these earlier attempts to create a replaceable labor force based on categories of imperial race and difference. Such structures counterpose good and bad migrants and good and bad minorities, even while they use stereotypes of dress, habit, appearance, smell, and so forth to control those minorities. As such, the Asian IT worker is often described as a good migrant against the specter of Muslim or Mexican or black others because she is educated and docile, especially when it comes to a willingness to be moved to where the work is needed and visa laws are permissive. At one level, such debates play out within the terms of nationality and citizenship. At another, they operate within a global division of labor in which non-white, white-collar migrants are made acceptable within a workforce because they are racialized in opposition to so-called problematic others. These maneuvers configure racialization as a necessary component of worker migration in the tech economy. Tech firms tend to present themselves as either progressive or politically neutral. For this reason, racism in tech offices often appears as an aberration, even while racism may flourish in the communities that surround these offices, and even while racist language appears regularly enough in such spaces as to become part of the normal operations of daily work life within these firms. Inside tech offices, racist sentiments circulate and are refuted as diatribes against an alien workforce. One example I collected from the internal message board of a Seattle area online marketplace in 2017 begins with the topic line, why South Indians don't groom themselves well. Can someone please help me understand why most of the South Indians don't care about their grooming attire and body odor? And of course, all the punctuation here was found in the original. I'm not adding, I'm not adding that. And there's more than what's on your screen here. The, the ellipses show you that the post was quite long and I don't really think I'm going to read it all out to you on this talk. The post was banned 30 minutes after it went up and the alias was banished from this section. The writer was designated a shit poster who only posts useless things. In the half hour that the post was up, it was seen 73 times, received no likes and four comments, two of which suggested the poster did indeed fit the stereotype of a racist and flagged the post for discrimination. Another response suggested that some people are just not aware of their own body odor. The speedy prohibition against this post suggests that many tech companies draw the line at explicit denigration of a group's bodily habits. Such discourses both establishes the moral authority of tech firms and some of their employees, and hides the constructed inequalities among kinds of workers who work within these companies. Yet my research unearthed asides, posters graffitied on, comments, and decisions about promotion, 
hiring, and replaceability that squarely treated some Asian workers, especially those with temporary visa status and imperfect English, as alien workers taking white middle-class jobs, and as disposable workers who were at least partially dehumanized as they were moved from one job site to another, and their replacement and long work hours justified through racist commentary like the kind I just described. These comments grew much more sharp when I followed such moments of racialization outside the boundaries of tech firms proper and into the communities that surround them. My third story comes from the neighborhoods around Seattle that are often described as the most racially diverse in the country, as my previous slide uh, with the map showed. In a middle school gym just north of Seattle, about eight months after the election of Donald Trump, students and parents sat in a semicircle around invited speakers, two representatives from the United States Attorney General's office, a local police chief, a child psychologist, and Amrita, the organizer of this event about responding to hate crimes and the leader of a local community organization for elderly Asians. Amrita began the meeting with slides compiled from real incidences that members of her organization and their families had experienced and reported to her. Amrita then asked each of the other guests to speak to what the victim should do in such situations. As she spoke, a series of immigrant nightmares flickered across the pull-down portable projector screen. I was told to go back to my own country. How should I respond? I was coming out of a coffee shop in my neighborhood and someone threw coffee in my direction, narrowly missing me. What should I have done? My high schooler was told he was a terrorist and derogatory things were written on his locker. I was stopped at a traffic light when two men pulled up in a car next to me. They said racist and sexist things then tailgated me. I was scared and worried for my safety. Everyone had boarded a domestic flight and only I was asked to leave. I was a bystander and I witnessed someone being harassed. I was filling up my car at a gas station. Someone came up to me and asked, are you Hispanic or Muslim? I was waiting at my bus stop when two men jumped out of an SUV with darkened windows and asked me for my immigration papers. They asked, did I have a green card or an H-1B? My child was harassed on the school bus and told that with, the Don with Donald Trump now elected, she would have to leave the country. What am I to do? At the meeting, I sat next to a man who I would see several other times at several other meetings. When I finally heard him speak at one of these meetings, I was shocked at what I heard. The man, an immigrant from Taiwan, described months of harassment in detail. He had been hollowed, followed home from work. He had had dog feces placed on his lawn. He had had car lights shown through his living room window. When I met him later in a cafe near his house, the man, whom I call Philip, asked for my pen. He drew for me the winding road that it ends at a cul-de-sac where he lives. It is impossible, he said, that anyone would be parked and waiting on that street for any other reason but to harass me. The street does not lead anywhere else. And this is that small picture he drew in my notebook. It's it's actually quite unusual when you're doing ethnographic research for people to ask for your notebook and, and write in it. And I thought this was a real, uh, a real moment of vulnerability on his part. And also, he wanted, I believe, someone to bear witness to what really was a series of harassment that, uh, that he, he could do very little about. I bought cameras, Philip told me when I met him next, and installed them on my roof. But they were cheap cameras from Costco, he continued, and they couldn't capture everything in enough detail. He had uploaded all these videos to YouTube, and we watched a few together. During the first one, Philip pointed out the relevant features to me. A car comes down the street at night. It makes a slow turn, then waits. It reverse, its reverse lights blink on. We see Philip come down his driveway toward the car. The car is put in drive and speeds away. The hairs on the back of his neck stood on end as we reached the end of the video. It did indeed look like someone was watching his house, the driver using the car's rearview mirror to do so. In the next clip, we see the lines 
of young pines that mark the edge of Philip's property. A man and his dog enter, scream left. The two disappear for a while behind the trees and emerge from the other side, finally moving to the right and out of sight of the camera. The man is letting his dog poop on the edge of Philip's lawn. This goes on every day for more than two weeks. Philip stopped the video to offer me further visual evidence, toggling between his online account and his phone's photos. He blazed through dozens of still photographs of dog poop, glistening, wet, curled, and gigantic, now nestled together in series on his phone. He scrolled and I nearly wretched the pile's vile odor seeming to emerge from the glass of Philip's handheld screen. Philip's choice to install video cameras made use of a logic of surveillance that would ultimately disappoint him. He believed that better evidence would produce prosecutable results, but the grainy quality of the video thwarted his desire. Even with perfect picture quality, like that of his dog poop stills, it is debatable that law enforcement could do anything without proof of racial motive. The poop, too, was extruded just beyond the pines that marked Philip's property line and would not count as destruction of property. In the end, Philip and his family moved to California where he hoped to escape the social and psychological effects of live surveillance, of a life of surveillance and counter surveillance he'd been living. <clears throat> These moments of racialization that exist in the eddies of the tech economy prefigured the anti-Asian racism that is currently sweeping the country. Even while they replay earlier moments of rage against Asian populations in the U.S., who have been blamed periodically for taking white jobs, and as Nayan Shah relates in his study of San Francisco's smallpox epidemics, spreading infectious disease. My final story stems from the most recent development in the relationship between tech, labor, and the South Asian diaspora. In my previous work, I recognized that most of the Indian tech workers I met were Hindu, middle class or upper class, and from dominant caste backgrounds. It was clear to me that even while these workers' labor was racialized within a hierarchy of types of workers, they were also part of a mobile middle class that both, le both leveraged and perpetuated caste privilege. Like race, caste is a descent-based system that discriminates against people because of their birth. Caste oppression assigns groups particular positions in a hierarchy prohibits knowledge and learning to these groups, and also, historically, to all women. Like systems of enslavement, caste is meant is a means of controlling labor, reproduction, and sexuality in order to keep that social hierarchy in place. Caste exists as a form of oppression in many places and in many religions. The Annihilation of Caste, which is also the title of a very important book by B.R. Ambedkar, who drafted the Indian constitution and was himself of an oppressed caste background, has been something that activists from Dalit and other oppressed caste backgrounds have been working hard for, for almost as long as, has, as there has been religious doctrine establishing caste impression itself. In the past several years, organizers in the Dalit community in India and the United States have brought to our collective attention the enormity of the harassment, bullying, and discrimination faced by oppressed caste workers across multiple industries and within universities. This action, this organization, culminated in April of 2021 in a hearing in Santa Clara, California, by the Human Rights Commission of that county, who will decide soon whether they will recommend making caste a protected category in county employment laws. This effort was spurred on by a case against Cisco Systems by a Dalit software engineer who is arguing that two uh, bosses of this engineer practiced caste discrimination at work, and the case is ongoing. This hearing, which I attended remotely over Zoom, as did all other participants, lasted over seven hours. It included testimony, some anonymous, some not, by those who have suffered caste-based discrimination in Silicon Valley, and testimony by those who support and oppose making caste a protected category in the county and more broadly. 
Hour after hour, we heard one-minute speeches by mothers and daughters who called out the need for protection from caste discrimination. Trans South Asians who talked about caste oppression, members of the Sikh and Hindu religions who denounced caste discrimination and wanted this resolution passed. But we also heard testimony upon testimony about how unnecessary such a protection would be, charges that such categories of discrimination would be impossible to enforce, and the charge that it would put a target on the back of Hindu children in the valley who had previous to this moment been unaware of caste. I was raised in the Hindu tradition and consider myself a practicing Hindu, though most would consider my practice unorthodox, and I am in favor of including caste as a protected category in employment law, and more broadly, I support the project of caste annihilation, which is a cognate category to abolition in a racial justice frame. Over the past two years, I have had to learn about the complicated ways that race articulates with caste in tech economies. In the highly specialized practice that coding has become, Indian programmers are situated at the point where racialized demands of this work become evident. This racialization both hides and makes more extreme the operation of caste discrimination as, an as another means of dividing and extracting labor across the South Asian tech diaspora. And again, I am not going to read this entire slide. This is from written testimony submitted to the Santa Clara County. But the survey that it references finds that one in four Dalit Americans have experienced verbal or physical assault because of their caste, and one in three students experienced discrimination. Okay. These are important facts that are coming to our attention in part through the Cisco case, but also through ongoing activism on the part of especially uh, Dalit feminists in the United States and in India. Returning to Minakshi's joke from my first story for a moment about the computer and it being a stupid cook. Such joke, jokes distance computer programmers from the mute machines they operate and allow them to play with extractions form. When they do so, they also consolidate their own expertise. Dividing oneself from a dumb machine is also a way of producing expertise over and against inexpert manual laborers. Along this rupture, Minakshi's joke about the very stupid computer sets some Indian programmers off from their machines and establishes their high caste upper class status by means of their expertise. Eschewing the usual markers of caste such as dress and food and marriage practices, these programmers reestablish caste on the grounds of professional corporate labor. As Satish Deshpande argues, such maneuvers leave caste itself as only a property of lower caste subjects. Such labor also tries, however, temporarily to insert upper and middle class, upper caste Indian workers into a cosmopolitan elite where race might stop mattering. Meenakshi's separation of herself off from the cook operates as if the machine itself had caste. The machine's low caste status is established through its own manual processing, while Minakshi's expert knowledge establishes her high caste status for her. They both make cook code, but only Minakshi does so expertly. As the image of the racialized Indian coder is ruptured, another image of another worker elsewhere is consolidated. The oppressed caste tech worker who is subject to hazing, bullying, wage garnishment, and harassment in tech firms by privileged caste bosses. The manual and skilled temple builder whose labor is hidden behind the temple facade. In the growing movement to bring caste into public awareness and move against it, the politics of caste within the politics of race must be refused and new forms of allegiance refashioned. Across all of these narratives, I have argued that race, racism, and racialization are fundamental to the construction of labor in tech economies. There are some key lessons to be learned from reading across these stories. First of all, when we think about race and technology, we most often approach this topic from the perspective of fairness, bias, and accountability. In doing so, reduce, we reduce the geography of race's activity to the subjects of bias and exclusion. 
Bias and exclusion are two important modalities through which race functions as a technology. It works through algorithmic decision-making to disenfranchise populations, and it works through unjust design to circumvent the needs of populations of color. But exclusion is only one modality through which race operates in and through digital technologies. Racialization also operates as a way to stratify labor across the landscape of global corporate tech economies. It works to move migrant labor from one side of work to another, and it operates to extract labor from race bodies that keep company hierarchies in place and produce value for those who organize these firms. To deal with race and racism as a mode of labor stratification means that the category of race itself needs to be rethought as an expansive designation that is linked in the case of the South Asian diaspora, especially to the practices of caste and caste oppression. Expanding on race as it articulates with other categories of biologized discrimination like caste and like gender means paying attention to how race can both reveal other modes of discrimination through thinking about race as a means of controlling and stratifying labor. And at the same time, race can hide these other modes because it's very logic, reproducing as it does difference as marked by the epidermis cannot identify differences within racialized groups very easily. In this talk, I've urged you to think of race and other descent-based categories as categories of racialism, racialization and racism that create the labor force that makes the entire tech industry work. It does so not just through exclusion and bias, but by forms of inclusion that are themselves stratified and exploitative. This may take the form of what Tressie McMillan Cottom and Kianga Yamada Taylor called predatory inclusion. The creation of tech products targeted to disadvantaged and poor populations that trade on promises of financial and social advancement to offer substandard products. Or it may take the form of stratification across global labor markets. And yet another mode of the global and racialized imaginary of tech it may take the form of treating poorer countries as dumping grounds for suspect tech products, from outmoded computer systems of earlier decades to non-existent controls on social media harassment of our own. Yet it will not do for any of us, especially me, to focus on anti-Asian racism in tech without at the same time calling out the forms of discrimination exploitation and oppression at work within these same communities. Going back to the very first image I showed you, to think about the welcome and unwelcome of immigration on stolen land is to think about all of these categories, race, caste, gender, indigeneity, as they come together, overlap and articulate with one another. To understand race and tech economies, as a mode of labor discipline and domination that is historically grounded in the experiences of indenture and enslavement is to immediately open up that same critique to caste as a form of labor domination that is perpetuated through, within, and alongside race as a stratifying violent technology. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Some really nice comments in the in the side, speaking to speaking to eye opening. Oh, we're hearing sound. Um, did you have any questions you wanted to start with, Sarita, in, in those that have been posted? Otherwise, I'm happy to pitch you questions. Can you hear me, first of all? I can hear you, yes. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm happy to, to have you pitch me questions. All right, super. Well, let me start with uh, one of the first questions which was asked, which was why you came to choose Germany. Yeah, thank you. Yes, that's a question I get a lot. I appreciate it. Uh, when I was constructing this project, I really wanted to get out of the US-India binary because, in fact, the tech industry is global. It's a transnational industry. It has offices all over the world. And 
you know, when we're only working within the US India binary, we tend to focus on pretty much exclusively at that time, at least on a very high achieving set of migrants. But in fact, um, there are coders who haven't graduated from the very best schools in India, meaning the IITs, uh, who move all over the world through these short term contracts. And I wanted to understand what this global system of labor looked like from their perspective. And of course, the other reason I chose Germany is because Germany has a very long post World War II now tradition of using guest work. And I thought there was a very interesting resonance and parallel between the guest worker programs um, uh, that Germany mobilized. Of course, there are links to the Bracero program in the US as well, and the use of short term visas to move coding labor to different sites in the transnational economy. Fantastic. Thank Fantastic. you. Thank you. Um, let me ask a uh, it, it was not a question, but somebody commented that your talk had opened their eyes to what tech colonialism is, which is hooray. That's great. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything else you'd like to add about that context. If we have folks who this is sort of a eye opening introduction. To you. Is there anything else about tech colonialism you'd like to speak to? Yes, sure. It, and it's a very broad topic, but what I think is really important about understanding tech colonialism is to understand the way that uh, forms of data collection that come out of the experience of enslavement and the experience of colonization really undergird the systems that we're building today, which is true in terms of um, AI systems, spatial recognition systems, but also in terms of labor um, and how labor gets stratis stratified across the industry. And what's very important to me, and I think you've, you've seen this across the talk, is to really think about how older forms of um, labor control get re-articulated in the current moment. And that can even be pre-colonial forms like caste oppression, and as well as how that comes together with uh, the large movements of labor in the period of the 19th century and 20th century in terms of indenture. Um, one thing that I would, I would really like to emphasize about tech colonialism is that um, it's really important, again, not to be Manichaean, not to be to, to think in terms of good and bad, black and white, West and non-West, as if uh, one side of that equation is, is exploitative and the other side is only being exploited. Actually, in, in the world, the, the global frame that I'm taking on on this is that we have to think about landscapes of uh, extraction landscapes of labor mobilization, landscapes of predatory inclusion that cut across geographies. Could could you say a little bit more about the term predatory inclusion? We have an anonymous request. Oh, yeah. uh, somebody says, I often see the word inclusion itself as a privileged usage of including others. Uh, so. So I think this is one of my, my uh, favorite current working terms. I, I'm drawing here on the scholarship of Tracy McMillan Cotham in particular and Kianga Yamada Taylor also. The idea here is that often when we think about race and racism, we really focus in on bias and forms of exclusion. Those are clearly very important. That's how we get a criminal justice system that clearly isn't working properly. On the on the other hand, for those of us who are really interested in understanding how products get developed, how populations around the world get drawn into, let's say, banking or fintech, um, real estate, all of those cutting edge um, ways that capital gets accumulated, it's also we are having a system freeze that is not just me checking there. I apologize for that. Hopefully we're going to be able to uh, to get Sarita back any minute now. Ah, you're back. Fantastic. I will return to, to Kim's talk momentarily. Uh, but June 30th is the next one. Glad you're back. Great to see you. Hello. Uh, yes, I was, I was unceremoniously booted out. Um, I of think all the people the, to boot out. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the last thing I was talking about is the way when we think about race and tech, we should also think about 
ways that people are, people are included in products that seem like they're going to benefit them, but that actually lead to further harms or further kinds of exploitation. That's kind of my answer on that. All right, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, there are a number of questions around inter Asian and inter Indian conflicts, and I and I want to get to them in a minute. But there's there's one person who asks, given the focus on uh, lower paid high tech labor in other countries such as the Ukraine, they wonder would it be more accurate to frame your first story as one of socioeconomic status rather than race? So you've been speaking to. Uh, the embroilment of race and caste, how, how would you bring questions of, of socioeconomic status into the conversation? Yeah, I think that's a great question. The way I think about the intersection of race and class is to think about what modality, and, and I'm kind of borrowing language from Stuart Hall here, what modality is socioeconomic difference expressed in? So being in Germany, this is another really interesting thing about being in Germany. There was a way in which um, people from Eastern Europe, Eastern Germany behind the Iron Curtain were talked about that actually was somewhat similar to the way in which racialized others were talked about. And so I think you have to always think about how that socioeconomic difference is phrased or um, conceptualized in racial terms, in cultural terms. And I would imagine for people in the Ukraine uh, who are maybe working transnationally with people in Western Europe, there are ways in which they're talked about um, that that would sound very familiar in terms of dress, food, English ability, and so on. So I think those things are always articulating together. Thank you. Um, so there are a number of questions that that speak to questions of intercaste dynamics and also regional dynamics from from one part of India to another. Somebody commented on the use of South Indians in the screen mm -hmm. capture that you showed. Um, would you like to speak to those dynamics? And do you have any thoughts on what what those of us in tech uh, work sites can do to lessen those kinds of dynamics? Yeah, thank you for those questions. Those posts are all are anonymous. Um, and so, of course, I'm not going to speculate too much on the ethnicity of the poster, except to say that it is fully possible that it was posted by someone who considers themselves to be North Indian or North Indian upper caste and is using South Indian as a term of uh, derogation against uh, people who aren't from the Hindi speaking style. It could also be somebody who, uh, and you hear this all the time, South Indian gets exchanged with South Asian, gets exchanged with Southeast Asian. Those are all often used interchangeably uh, by people when they're speaking. I think, I think that's a great point. For me, the point is to show how these moments are kind of recursively creating differences among um, among a labor force, right? And they're used to discipline workers in various ways. Um, on what people in tech firms can do, uh, I think there is a, we're at a really interesting moment in which it, it's really becoming clear that caste is also an, a labor issue. And there are teams working in all tech organizations now to bring um, caste to the table, to their HR teams, more broadly to see it recognized as a protected category. I would say that's really where the work begins. Um, in addition to that, I think that you know there, there are some cross um, industry collaborations that couldn't be really, really powerful uh, on pushing um, cast as a protected category and making sure that it's part of uh, tech labor movements more broadly because it really is a labor issue. And, and, for en engineering, it's just the first domain. There's also all the ancillary domains when, when it comes to food preparation, child care, domestic service, and so on and so forth that also need to be thought, of, thought, thought very carefully about and talked about openly. Thank you. Um, questions are sort of rolling in and we're not going to be able to get to all of them, which makes me sad. Um, 
I like this one. As humanities and ethnographic analyses of global tech becomes more common, what, in your opinion, is a productive way for tech industries to act on social criticism of how labor practices operate within them? I think you've answered that to some extent, but perhaps we can expand on that. Is it policy changes? Um, in which case, I'm of the opinion that big tech can't regulate itself, says the poster. Or is it that tech industry should hire more humanities scholars and social science? How does practical reform happen? Oh, I've got a multi-part answer to that one. So <laughs> my first, the first part of the answer is something that I think is changing, and I think this series is a big part of, of this change, is, is when I first started doing my research, tech firms were really close to researchers working from a social science or humanities point of view. And one of the biggest things that we need to do is to allow humanities and social science researchers in the door um, to do their own independent research. In other words, not funded by the corporations themselves to understand how these practices are working. Um, that, that would be incredibly important to me. Secondly, I do agree tech companies uh, can't regulate themselves. There definitely needs to be a push from reg for regulation. And um, in addition to the push from the outside for regulation, I think the push from the inside from tech workers themselves who want to see change within their companies is extremely important to making those shifts happen. And then my third answer is that uh, we need to see more support in general across the tech landscape for um, independent uh, products, companies, initiatives, who are starting from the perspective of indigenous communities, um, minority communities of various kinds, and are building tech that's specifically for those communities. That Mary Mary Gray just posted a question asking about uh, whether you, with regard to uh, predatory inclusion, if you had thoughts on how companies could turn to notions of design justice, thinking of uh, Sasha Costanza Chuck's work as a practice, and it sounds like that's sort of where you're headed. Yeah, In I mean, uh, this is a this is an interesting and tricky question uh, because I believe that predatory inclusion is. Uh, part of the logic of how design and development is currently operating. And so this is a structural question. What you're really asking for is a structural question in terms of what projects get funded, why, by whom, and therefore what projects get designed. So I think you'd have to reimagine and rethink um, what kind of products we want from the ground up, which is a design justice principle, but it's one that would require a much larger restructuration of how projects get legitimacy, backing, funding, support, who gets supported, uh, what are the processes by which participation and inclusion unroll. It's, it's kind of requires a change at all levels. All right, thank you. We are at time, so thank you so much. This has been so interesting. I have learned a lot, um, and I really appreciate all the questions that everybody offered. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them. Uh, please join us again on June 30th. We'll be welcoming Dr. Kim Talbear at the University of Alberta, who will be giving a talk called The Vanishing Indian Speaks Back, Race, Genomics, and Indigenous Rights. And we hope to see you all there. Tell your friends. Bye, thank you so much.